Welcome. This is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. In recent weeks, we've been told to focus on a series of scandals which, we are told, are rocking the Obama administration. Has the media finally found outrage over the Obama regime's use of drone strikes to kill scores of innocent women and children in countries that are not even at war with the United States? Or the DOJ's recent admission that the strikes had indeed killed American citizens? Or John Kerry's recent attempts to once again lead the American public into supporting military intervention in the Middle East based on provably false claims of WMD? Of course not. No, the media's sudden discovery of outrage is directed at an entirely different scandal. The fact that reporters have now allegedly found themselves in the government's crosshairs. The Associated Press reported on Monday that it had been told by the U.S. Justice Department that some of its phone records had been subpoenaed. Quoting secret sources, the AP had recently broken stories about the arrest of an al-Qaeda terrorist in Yemen and the U.S.'s use of the Stuxnet virus in an attempt to sabotage Iran's nuclear energy program. U.S. officials defended their move Tuesday afternoon, saying that such government leaks present a threat to national security. Phone records from AP bureaus in New York, Washington, and Hartford were subpoenaed, along with some of the home and cellular phone records of AP journalists involved in the exclusives, all for the months of April and May of last year. AP President Gary Pruitt fired off a letter to Holder on Monday night calling the subpoenas a serious interference with the AP's constitutional rights to gather and report the news. To add fuel to the fire of this current controversy, it's recently been revealed that Fox News reporter James Rosen has been under investigation by the Justice Department as a possible co-conspirator in a case involving leaked State Department information on North Korean nuclear tests. Particularly galling is the fact that Attorney General Eric Holder personally signed off on the investigation and is now being charged with leading the investigation into the investigation. The story has given the media a chance to mention a point that we have been painstakingly documenting for years here at BoilingFrogsPost.com, namely that the Obama administration is the worst in the history of the United States when it comes to pursuing investigations into government whistleblowers, with more whistleblower prosecutions under the Obama DOJ's belt than all other presidencies in the history of the country combined. Sadly, though, most of the media's faux outrage over these scandals has been used to shift the debate once again to how special journalists are and how this scandal is worthy of outrage, more so than all of the other atrocious abuses of civil liberties that have taken place in the Obama era, apparently. It is especially ironic, then, that at almost the exact same time that the media was wringing their hands over their own privileged status as special citizens of the United States who deserve extra protections from governmental intrusion, a story millions of times wider in scope was accidentally broken during a live CNN interview with former FBI counterterrorism agent Tim Clemente, and then almost immediately forgotten. And Tim, is there any way, and now obviously it was a voicemail, they could, they could try to get the, the phone companies to give that up at this point, but if it's not a voicemail, it's just a conversation. There's no way they actually can find out what happened, right? Unless she tells them. No, there is a way. They, we certainly have ways in, in national security investigations to find out exactly what was said in that conversation. Um, it's not necessarily something that the FBI is going to want to present in court, but it may help lead the investigation and or lead the questioning of her. So somewhere so we can it's being find digitized or they can actually get that. Because everyone, people were saying, look, yeah, that wouldn't be well, possible. Yes. It's pretty incredible what you're saying. No, welcome welcome to America. The uh, there, All of that stuff is being captured as we speak, whether we know it or like it or not. Note to self, as uh, exactly. Deb Farrick just said here, yeah. All right, thanks very much to, to both of you. Obviously, that, that right there, a very significant thing, because people have been saying, well, there's a conversation. If it wasn't a voicemail, they don't know. If they can find out, that could obviously become crucial. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the phone call between Catherine Russell and her husband, Tamlin Sarnayev. You said something very interesting on Aaron Burnett's show last night. You said that if Catherine Russell does not divulge the contents of this phone call, that the FBI had other methods finding out what was said. What did you mean by that? Well, on the national security uh, side of the House, we're in, the, in the federal government, you know, we have assets. There's lots of assets at our disposal throughout the intelligence community, and also not just domestically but overseas. Those assets are, allow us to gain information and intelligence 
on things that we can't use ordinarily in a criminal investigation, but are used for major terrorism investigations or counterintelligence investigations. And you're not talking that about a voicemail, right? What are you talking about exactly? I'm talking about all digital communications are, are um, there, there's a way to, to look at digital communications in the past. Um, and I can't go into detail of how that's done or what's done, but I can tell you that no digital communication is secure. And so these communications will be found out. They will, the conversation will be known. And it's just a question of whether or not Catherine Russell decides to own up to what was said prior to that information being known or after the fact. Where is the outrage over this admission? Where are the scores of journalists lining up to demand answers and calling for the heads of the government officials who are clearly involved in the complete abrogation of the Fourth Amendment right to freedom from unlawful search and seizure of all Americans' information, not just the special journalist class? Of course, there is no outrage over an admission like this. Partially, this is because the story comes as a surprise to absolutely no one who has been following the actual story of government electronic surveillance over the last 19 years. Not only has the admission that the American intelligence establishment is spying on all communications of all citizens in the U.S. been documented for years, including here at the Eye Opener, where we specifically covered this very topic last month, but in fact this very level of surveillance has been hardwired into law since the passage of the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act of 1994, or CALIA. That this level of surveillance has been mandated by statute for 19 years is not conjecture or conspiracy theory. When contacted by the Huffington Post about Clemente's recent admission, FBI Public Affairs Spokesman Christopher M. Allen specifically referred to the congressional testimony of FBI General Counsel Valerie Caproni citing the act as the legal framework for such surveillance. Again, there is nothing essentially new in this recent testimony of Clemente, which only further affirms what NSA whistleblowers have been telling us for years about the reality that government agencies are collecting and storing every single phone call, email, text message, and fax that flows through the country. The FBI has access to the data collected, which is basically the emails of virtually everybody in the country, uh, and they have a, the FBI has access to it. All the congressional members are on, on this surveillance too. It's not, no one's excluded. They're all included. So yes, this can happen to, uh, to anyone if they become a target for whatever reason. Um, if they are targeted by the government, the government can go in or the FBI or uh, other agencies of the government can go into that database, pull all that data they've collected over them, on them over the years and reanalyze it all. So retroactively analyze everything they've done over the last 10 years at least. And it's not just about those who, who could be planning, who could be a threat to, to national security, but, but also those who could be just... It's everybody. When faced with this blatant double standard, collection of reporters' phone records is national news worthy of 24-7 coverage, while the collection of all communications of every single citizen barely rates a mention in the news cycle, there's only one possible conclusion. The outrage over the AP spying and Fox News spying scandals is contrived and is designed only to hardwire the wholesale surveillance of the public even further into law. To see precisely how this is accomplished, one need only look at a recent conversation on Morning Joe where Carl Bernstein, the revered reporter who, along with his ex-naval intelligence partner Bob Woodward, was allowed to break the Watergate scandal, goes out of his way to stress that there is statutory authority for this type of spying. Carl, I just want to know what you're thinking at this point, responding to the story. That it's totally inexcusable that this administration has been terrible on this subject from the beginning. The object of it is to intimidate people who talk to reporters. This was an accident waiting to become a nuclear event, and now it's happened. Uh, there's no excuse for it whatsoever. There's no reason for this investigation, uh, especially on this scale. Is there statutory authority for it? Yes, probably. And with that rhetorical sleight of hand, the issue of constitutional authority has been sidestepped and statutory authority has now been inserted into the debate. The next step is simply to provide another statutory solution to the scandal, one that, while appearing to solve the problem, can in fact be booby-trapped to specifically allow the types of abuses that it was designed to prevent in the first place. 
Amid the Justice Department scandal, there's renewed interest in protecting the media's First Amendment rights. Now we see media organizations pushing for what's called shield laws to protect reporters. And it looks like the Obama administration is on board. Here's President Obama talking about the law yesterday in the Rose Garden. So uh, you know, the whole goal of uh, this media shield law that was worked on and largely endorsed by folks like the Washington Post editorial page and by prosecutors was finding a way to strike that balance appropriately. Uh, and to the extent that this case, uh, which we still don't know all the details of, to the extent that this case has prompted renewed interest about how do we strike that balance properly, then I think uh, uh, now's the time for us to go ahead and revisit that legislation. But it's important to point out that even this shield law allows exceptions when it comes to national security issues. That's why it's unclear if such a law would have helped out the Associated Press at all. This is how the scandal game works between the federal government and the lapdog media. The media tells us what to be outraged about and sets the ball in motion for a political solution that will be provided by the very criminals who caused the outrage in the first place. Once the task of moving the ball further down the court has been accomplished, the media can safely move back to breathlessly reporting on the latest antics of Justin Bieber or the latest gossip about Amanda Bynes, content in the knowledge that the public will have completely forgotten what they were supposed to be angry about in the first place. After all, it never directly affected them anyway, did it? It is only when we stop allowing the media to direct our outrage at prearranged targets and stop allowing the Washington criminals to provide their phony solutions that we will ever have a chance at moving toward the delegitimization and ultimately the dismantling of the criminal agencies of the criminal government that are responsible for all of the real criminal outrages, including the collection of everyone's electronic communications, that continues to take place. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.